finally I get to meet you in person. I know. This is the wonder of social media, right? Is like you can see, follow somebody on Instagram, see all the Instagram stories that you are very yes. good at. Yeah, I do. Have <laughs> you really like fun. meet somebody who's like, God, I feel like I feel like <laughs> yeah, I, no. I know you. I was literally filming my bunion when you text me back this morning. I was like, oh, what are the odds? <laughs> she doesn't see it. That's so funny. But I do, just yeah. quietly, because we're bonding. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I found you through Wei Li when she was having trouble getting right. into the country. Oh, I forget what trip that was. I think it was like that was in I just because I just looked up the video we did from that visit. I think it was October, October. Of last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in Boston. Yeah, when she and came. I was like, "Who's Tulsi?" Mm-hmm. And then from there, it was just a big old rabbit hole. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things. I was like, "How? How? <laughs> this is me. I was supposed to be her." Wow. Because we're the same age. Yeah. I mean, same. What year. month were you born? November. Okay. Have you seen the Scorpio I got, tattoo? I got the world ready for you. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. it's pretty <laughs> bad. It's hard to. <laughs> Miss. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. Did you have a four year old tattoo that? Yes. Yeah. Potentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll save that story for later. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's going to be a lot of good stories. Potentially. Coming. Yeah. Yeah. So 81. 81. Yeah. Yeah. I was born in April. Um, I was born in American Samoa. And then uh, three older brothers came before me. And then we moved to Hawaii. And uh, that's where my little sister was born. Wow. And never, maybe unlike you, I don't know, but I never, ever, ever thought I want to be president. I want to be in politics. I was like the most shy, most introverted, most uh, happy to surf and hike and keep my nose in books. And I did martial arts as a kid and like, I was good. That's Amazing. Good. So. Yes, definitely. That was unlike me. My goal from day one was I'm going to be the first female president of the United States. Wow. So when I saw you and what you're doing, and I'm like, I'm going to reincarnate myself through yeah. Tulsi. <laughs> and then it drives me nuts because everybody we've met, like we were in Ohio for yeah. the Arnold, and I just keep talking about you. And I'm like, Do you, you haven't heard of Tulsi? And they're mm. like, who's Tulsi? Yeah. I'm like, how is this possible? Yeah. But we know how it's possible, kind of. And yeah. I definitely have questions about that yeah. and how all this stuff works. Yeah, I think that's going into this campaign. I I knew that like I wasn't going to get cut any breaks. There weren't going to be any, you know, easy like shortcut hacks or anything like that. Uh because throughout my entire time in public service and in politics, you know, I've been um not shy about shining light on the truth and saying the things that a lot of people are not willing to say but uh, that people deserve to know so we can actually start fixing some of the problems that we have. And, you know, when you speak truth to power, power gets a little scared. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) so I knew, I knew, I knew what we, I I thought I knew exactly what challenges we'd be up against. But I think what I didn't fully realize was uh, how the media, really, the, the corporate media in our country pick and choose who they want to cover, how they want to cover people, um, and therefore control the information that voters, the American people, have access to. And this began the very, the very first day that I announced my candidacy for president. The very first day. I've been in Congress now for, you know, was it six years at that time when I had announced, still serving the National Guard, like I, you know, deployed twice to the Middle East and all of this stuff. Day one, I'm about to walk out onto the stage to deliver my speech in Hawaii, why I'm running for president. And uh, NBC News throws out this article that we had a feeling was coming because they sent some strange questions that they wanted me to answer, but they, they released it a lot earlier than, than, we, than they said they would. Uh, of course. To coincide with my announcement. And the gist of the article was, you can't trust Tulsi Gabbard because she is a Russian asset. <sighs> And that's where that that um, that began there, and and what we've seen throughout this campaign from that day to now is a very blatant, um, intentional either complete blackout where, where people on national television, so-called journalists, anchors, and others, they won't even acknowledge that I'm in the race, uh, that I'm running for president, <clears throat> that I've been doing so for over a year. 
Or if they do, it comes with snide remarks, baseless attacks, attempts to smear my character, my campaign, and, and who I am, what I'm about. And the thing that, that really is so telling for me is all of this is happening because whether it's them or political opponents or the DNC, they refuse to debate me on the substance of the message that I'm bringing throughout this entire campaign. Their go-to immediately is smear, undermine character, foment fear, doubt, suspicion, or just don't talk about her and hope people never learn about her. And that, that says it all. That's frustrating. Yeah, but that, that, this is where that, that frustration comes in because what we're seeing is, you know, we've been having town halls across the country, meeting people on social media, in person, and when people actually hear my message and learn what I'm about, mm -hmm. we get support. Oh, 100%. And it's across party lines. Mm -hmm. And it's coming from people who are like, hey, this isn't about me versus you, us versus them. This is about America. Yeah. It's about all of us. It's about our future and like, like how we solve problems, yeah. how we actually get, get stuff done. And that, that right there, like what you've experienced when you're going around saying, hey, you know, Tulsi this, that. And people are like, well, I've, I've never heard of her. Yeah. That's, that's why. Yeah. That's why. I'm a recovering conspiracy theorist, so all these things pop up in my head. This was years ago, but you know, I'm just when it comes to the media and yeah. you know, realizing that at the top, you know, how many people actually control our media globally. Yeah. You know, very I've, few. Yeah. I've had some experiences myself that were, you know, quite fascinating that mm. allowed me to see firsthand how powerful it is and how, yeah. you know, one thing can get twisted around and then all of a sudden it's global news and it's not even news. No. I'm like, why is this being talked about? Or real about? or true. Or true. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I yeah. hated <laughs> when Trump started coining fake news. I'm like, yeah, ah! I know. Ah! <laughs> so that was, uh, yeah, that's, that's know. what popped I in use, I've used that term a few times and it just, <laughs> because really, I mean, it is, it yeah. is. But then it gets caught up in the politics of like, oh, well, you're this if you use those words. It's just, that's part of the whole problem. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. So being, you know, in my upper 30s, M is in her late 20s. And, you know, I know I've, I've been overseas for the past almost decade mm -hmm. living in Southeast Asia and Australia. So I've not been, you know, super active in following politics and, and you know, how everything is rolled out. And so when I come back and I'm like now fascinated and interested and, yeah. and obviously a bit concerned about our future for yeah. a number of reasons, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, start to become curious and I'm like, there's so many things that are just completely over my head. Yep. And I consider myself to be, you know, relatively enlightened or, you know, um, I don't know. Informed. Uh, informed. Yeah. And there are still things where I'm like, I can't tell you how many YouTube videos I watched on uh, the electoral college. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, explain this delegate stuff, you yes. know? And then I think how many Americans are in that same boat, let yeah. alone don't even know you exist. Yeah. And I said, you're, you're here with what, two other candidates right now. Yeah. And everybody else has dropped three. out. And where's your name? Mm -hmm. But I see, you know, I get the emails, I get the texts, and I'm like, oh, she did it again. And yeah. oh, we got to come together and get this, get this money in there. Yeah. And you keep sliding through and sliding through. And that's how we know that your message is resonating because it's truly grassroots. Exactly. And that's what's incredible. Yeah. And that's, you know. Yeah. And, and it, it is, it's really inspiring to see that in spite of all of these massive obstacles, of big money, big power, big media, big poly, like all of this stuff that really embodies the powerful elite in Washington. Are you scared a little bit? I mean, you're not, no, Tulsi's not scared. No, I'm not. Right? I'm not. But and, I mean. And it's like, but this is the, this is, I mean, this is really, really the amazing thing is that there are, they represent the very few. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people across the country who have had enough mm -hmm. and um, and are and are in their own smaller big ways in whatever way they can, standing up and you know sharing the message or in whatever way possible, um, just saying like this is not okay and and this is this is about something much bigger than just my campaign. It's about the institutions that um, this country was built upon and how far away our government itself has gotten from those ideals of 
freedom of speech and truth and democracy and the voices of the people, um, the, the vision that our founders had for us. Yeah. And that's, that's the real risk. That's the danger. When CNN says, we're not going to let Tulsi Gabbard have a voice on any of our town halls, my, uh, my taking offense to that is not because of me. It's because of all of the people who, um, who are being disserved right. and dishonored by their choices of censorship yeah. and what impact that has on our democracy and in our country as a whole. What are the next steps? Like how, what, what's, what is this looking like moving forward in the next month or two? Things are always quickly evolving and changing. Um, you know, as, as we're having our conversation here, the uh, Super Tuesday has just uh, passed us behind. I've got and a couple Super of delegates. Super Tuesday is like, we need to raise Super a, Tuesday. a boatload of well, money. Well, Super Tuesday was the date that, <laughs> that there was a whole bunch of states that went and voted. And um, I got a couple of delegates through that voting process. And somebody, uh, somebody made a joke saying, okay, well, the DNC's debate standards prior to Super Tuesday uh, which was March 3rd, was that as a candidate, you had to have at least one delegate to qualify for the debate. And so it's like, oh, okay, so then I should qualify for the next debate. No, not so much. And they changed it, They right? changed the standard. They changed the standard. So How can you go and change it in the middle of an election? Yeah. Well, they, they, they have been moving the goalposts all along. And rather than recognizing, hey, there's three people left in the race, one of them is a woman, one of them is under 70, one of them <laughs> is a veteran, one of them uh, is the first female combat veteran ever to run for president, one of them is a woman of color. Like go down the, lo- go down the list instead of saying, hey, you know, if we believe in empowering the voices of uh, minorities, of women, of those who've been disenfranchised in this country for so long, let's maybe adjust and make sure that that, that voice is present at this critical juncture. They did it for Michael Bloomberg to allow him on the debate stage. <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> but they have chosen to do the opposite uh, in the situation. And that's where um, a lot of people, even those who don't support my candidacy, are getting fired up on Twitter and everything else, just saying like, okay, let's, let's, let's be real about the decisions that you're making here and um, what, what the negative effect is. So... You know, regardless of debate or no debate, for me as we go forward, it really is about continuing to bring voice to people whose voices are not being heard, to shine that light and speak truth to power in every respect, uh, because this is the only way that we, the people, can be the catalyst for change, for positive change, and the change that we need to see. 100%. Yeah. So being it's International Women's Day. Yes. Congrats. You too. What would you say that bringing the female energy to the presidency looks like what are you, what are you going to bring as a woman that hasn't been brought before what are we what are we missing what are we lacking mm. you know i have um well, rewind a little bit back Besides to 2016 being under 70 yeah <laughs> back back <laughs> in 2016 um in that primary election Obviously, there was Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And I got a lot of shit for endorsing Bernie Sanders over Hillary Clinton. I resigned from, as vice chair of the DNC to endorse him primarily because of one reason, the huge difference between them in their foreign policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hillary Clinton having a long history of being a war hawk, interventionist. Bernie Sanders, more inclined in the opposite direction. <laughs> And um, that was, so I wanted to, I wanted to bring voice to that as a veteran, as a soldier, I needed to make sure that voters understood and knew the difference because of course the media wasn't covering it. Right. And immediately the pushback I got from journalists and from quote unquote influencers was how dare you as a woman, how dare you not support someone who could potentially be the first female president that our country has seen. And I pushed back. I said, how dare you, how dare you assume that I have no ability to think or see beyond my gender, that that is the only thing 
that matters to me in my life. And what were you wearing when you said that? I have no <laughs> idea. Probably surf shorts <laughs> and <people> slippers. <laughs> I was, I actually have one, one specific memory of this sitting in my living room in Hawaii, probably in surf shorts and slippers and a t-shirt. <laughs> but that's, that's where even in this election where we've had a historic number of women running for president mm -hmm. and amazing like meeting these little girls who will come to my town halls with their families. And I'll ask them, I was like, you want to run for president one day? And some of them were like, uh, yeah. That's and others amazing. are like, no, why would I want to do that? Like, yeah. who cares? Either way, like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, right? Mm -hmm. But people still just saying, it's time for a woman president. It's time for a woman. And I always just say, it's time for the right woman. Uh -huh. And that matters yep. a lot. Yep. Um, and that's, for me, what I would bring uh, as the first female president of this country Amazing. is, is uh, all of who I am in the combination of the aloha spirit that comes from Hawaii, which really means aloha means love. It means compassion and care. It means I come to you with respect and I see you for who you are, that we are brothers and sisters and inspired, therefore, to... to uh, take care of each other, you yeah. know, work, work yeah. for the well-being of humanity, of people, the planet. Bitch, I got a tear. Uh, <laughs> I do. When you started talking about little girls yeah. coming up to you and, you know, and then the uh, mixture of emotions and being like, yeah. oh, the frustration of, yeah. you know, why your message isn't being heard. Yeah. And, and then the frustration of, you know, it being so diluted and confusing that mm -hmm. most people just switch off. Yeah. You know, that's why I was like, we need to get you somewhere in a leg day bitch hoodie. So yeah, right. all these people <laughs> under 35 will be like, no, 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 no. Yeah, yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I gotta say, exactly. when I saw you snowboarding, I was like, she's the real yeah. deal. <laughs> oh, just shredding down the hill. And that 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 right there though is just being real. Yeah. Because politicians, whether whether it's true or perceived, like we have this situation of manufactured caricatures. Mm-hmm that that is not real and it's because a lot of them are it's like okay you need to wear these clothes you need to say these words you need to make your hair like this you need to wear these white pearls and you know you you can't be that whole person that you are and that's been part of because of the media and, oh, yeah. and because you know yeah what are they going to say how are they going to critique you and ultimately for me it's it's you know uh just being conscious of of wanting to make sure that my message is the thing that gets through. Right, right, and not but what you're wearing. Exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> so if I showed up in like surf clothes every day, that might be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> but that's, it's, I've, I've just laughed like, as like, yeah, you know, go we'll invite voters and supporters to go out and go snowboarding or go surfing or whatever. And, and some of the articles that have been written is like, Tulsi's pandering. She's just, why are you pandering to snowboarders? Why are you pandering to mixed martial arts fans? Just like, this is who I am, guys. This is who I am. <laughs> you can take it or leave it. It's up to you. But, um, you know, it's, media, it's just crazy. It's it, crazy. It's such a machine. You yeah. know, Malcolm X was spot on. It can take anybody yes. and make them a hero or an absolute, yes. you know, villain. criminal yep. villain. Yep. And yep. Saw that, you saw that him, Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And yet, as, as we, you know, just celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Day not that long ago, I think that was um, something that, that a few folks started talking about is he's now universally celebrated. But when you look back at, you know, J. Edgar Hoover and what he did to Dr. King mm -hmm. and, um, you know, all the names he was called, the illegal surveillance, just all of the stuff, like that's like maybe not exactly the same way happening, but it's basically happening. Like let's smear and vilify and foment suspicion because you don't want people, the media doesn't want people to actually hear the truth. Yep. That's funny because that was something we were talking about on the plane last night was how, you know, at what point are we going to um, recognize as a country that this country was built off of the back of people of color? Yes. And, you know, it just keeps getting swept under the rug. And, yeah. you know, as a white cis woman mm -hmm. born in Northern California, I had no idea 
I really didn't. Yeah. Like I said, I thought to consider myself to be enlightened. And I used to say stupid stuff like, I don't see color. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had no idea like what the things I was saying. I was coming from a good place, obviously. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and truly believing that, but not understanding mm -hmm. white privilege mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the structure of everything. And as, you know, we're going through this journey and as much as I hate social media, you know, it, it does help because there are other voices that are now amplified and, you know, we're able to, to start dissecting this stuff. Yeah. And we were like, what a perfect person, yeah, a woman of color, combat vet mm. to come in and start talking about these types of things. So that was something that, you know, we had talked about in, in your experience going to that training. So M is a public health nurse mm. and what you experienced what was that like? Yeah, so it was it was an anti-racism training, um, mm -hmm. and it was an anti-racism 101. And again, I had the same that this you know Bay Area. I grew up in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. but I was of a generation where they were like, you know, love everybody equally, yeah. right? And that's what I've done my entire life. Right. But um, you know, learning about just the systematic institutionalization of people of color. Yeah. Um, and that, that you know, institutional racism. Yeah. Yeah. And how, you know, redlining occurred mm -hmm. and it, it just, things I just didn't know, yeah. you know, but until we address that, until we say, you know, we're, we're going to recognize this, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to continue to put people of color in that place. Yeah. And so, you know, it's for, for me, it's also looking at not only, you know, our our black populations but our native populations 100 percent. like it, it just it breaks my heart to see the amount of poverty yeah in our native populations and this is their land yeah right it is and and i saw a film recently i don't remember what it was called but it was uh based on a true story about uh the numbers of missing and murdered Native women in the country. Oh, yeah. Who aren't, yep. we've passed some legislation just recently to address this. Uh, President Trump signed it into law, which is good. But up until this point, they have remained nameless and voiceless, no collection of data or statistics to really understand how pervasive this problem is on different res reservations uh, amongst first people in this country and that that further you know uh, affirms that point that if that that their existence yeah. really doesn't matter and it hasn't for a long time and um i i have a friend from uh why well, we went to standing rock in north dakota a few years ago around the whole pipeline yeah. uh going and being built and threatening their water source we made some great friends with leaders there and one of them, uh, is Cody Two Bears is his name. His family is just, they're like, oh, amazing. You but can he see texted straight me. into your eyes, by the way. You can, you can see straight into your eyes. <laughs> anyway, carry on <laughs> as you were. <laughs> he, uh, he texted me the other day talking about the coronavirus and yeah. how you know I'm pushing for we need testing kits. They need to be available everywhere. Anybody who like drive in on site, like the bureaucracy is getting in the way of protecting the people of our country right now. And he just brought up the fact that um, they have no no real assistance on uh, tribal land. That the the Bureau of Indian Health Services like there's no access um, anywhere nearby, and then they can drive hours. And then they'll have to pay two or three thousand dollars to get the same kind of care that you or I could get if we went maybe to our doctor's office or to a local ER. And it's just it's there's so many. Unfortunately, you're right. I mean, there's so many different examples of this that um, is part of increasing understanding, learning about the experiences of people who have lived a completely different life, even generation after generation. Um, than, than we are and recognizing the strength yeah. in that understanding. And that's that's been one of the big issues that I've focused on throughout my campaign is this whole cancel culture, this idea that if you say something that offends me, then you are deleted from my world. And and it's, it, it is, it's dangerous. I, I spoke to a woman last night and she, um, I forget what state she's from, but she's going to Harvard business school right now and she was saying that in her experience there so far they are not encouraging free and open discussion 
that they that you cannot say things that others may possibly find minutely offensive and therefore i mean like what do you yeah what do you that, do that's <laughs> tricky again because we're you know same age we've been yeah. you know walked through the a lot of the same things and experiences and times and you know looking back it's like there wasn't that concept of oh, I'm offended in all these safe spaces. Yeah. And whilst it's great, you know, that where people are feeling more conscious, yeah, more conscious. But at the right. same time, with the same time, we, we have to understand that we are not all the same. Mm -hmm. We don't all have the same perspectives. We're going to disagree on things and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. And yeah. maybe we walk away still disagreeing, but respecting each other more for saying, Hey, at least now I know, why you feel the way you do or mm -hmm. where you're coming from and you know a little bit more about me and why you know what i mean like that's that's what is creating this toxic divisive culture yes is people are not even willing to say hey i, I actually really want to know i want to know why you know from someone I, and i and we have too afraid to ask right yeah exactly Be, yes. yeah and that's that that fear that yeah. fear of either asking or um feeling free to to say say what you feel yeah and you gotta, you have to, because yeah. you know, had I not, I was fortunate to have a, a few friends that helped walk me through the process with, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, understanding white privilege and, mm -hmm. you know, getting uncomfortable and being comfortable being uncomfortable because yeah. you're like, oh, wow, that's embarrassing. Or, mm -hmm. you know, like you, you go through that process of, okay, we gotta do better, yeah. but being okay with, you know, being called out on certain things yeah. and not taking it personally myself. Mm -hmm and being able to, to learn from it and grow. Because looking back, I'd hate to still be in that same box and not be aware of yeah. all these issues. Yeah. You know, so. There was a quote um, that I saw on President's Day scrolling through Instagram that someone put up I'd never seen before. Uh, but it is now my favorite quote from Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I do not like that man. I need to know him better. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's that to me right there is the answer. Is people That's people are gold. so frustrated. Like, how do we get past this divisiveness? How do we heal the wounds that uh, are in this country that are tearing us apart as people and as Americans? And like, that's it. That's why I keep being drawn back to you too. Is that you're you know uh, with our brand girl at the base of it, we believe that women are held back as a gender because we're born to see each other as competition. Mm. You know, and you and I growing up with Kate Moss and Cindy Crawford, and yeah. we didn't even have social media back then yeah. and apps and filters and, you know, bullying happened on the on the playground, not yeah. online and cyber yeah. bullying and all yeah. these kinds of things. Um, you know, so yeah, just. And I love the way that with your, you're walking the talk, mm. first of all, and uh, with your brand, even with your, That's us. even with your sizing, <laughs> I loved like um, when you were first texting me, like, okay, here's the Amanda size yeah. and this, and I was like, huh? like, but that's really cool because it. I mean, I know, like, okay, well, normally, like, this is the size I want to be, so I'm gonna go with that instead of like, this is it, right? Boys always I got what I got. Bigger <laughs> girls always wanted to be smaller, right? And you know, it's just, it's actually, we're, we're turning the page now and yeah. looking at a, a whole new world. And that was, you know, kind of something else that I was curious to, we were talking about yesterday to, to pick your brain on is, um, you know, if, if you see or where your stances are around uh, women's mental health yeah. and, you know, um, adolescent mental health and, and what that looks like, you know, with um, education around using social media and, and the advancements of technology in school and, yeah. and how they're pushing towards, you know, having school being more online and classes online. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has an iPad. Mm -hmm. Nine, 10 year olds are on social media, you know, and what that's doing because I, you know, when I wanted to be the first female president of the United States, which I'm totally, I'm, I'm living through you, girl. We're, yeah. we're, we're in you, this you ride okay or with, die. You okay with 100%, this? hundred percent. All right, good. hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm on your coattails on this one. Uh, you know, and thinking back and looking at what stopped me. And mm. so in, in 1999, did you graduate in 99? 
Mm, yeah, I think so. You're like, I was homeschooled. In 94, so I was like, you're yeah, like, you know, yeah. 98, 99, one of those. Genius. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but back then uh, as the uh, associated student body president, I was in a Christian rock band. Mm. You know, me and Jesus were tight. Mm. Uh, I was started the first girls golf team. Um, was the captain of the cheerleading team. You know, I was I was the epitome of a good kid. Yeah, 4.0. You know, grade average. And I started doing methamphetamines because I wanted to lose weight. Wow. Yeah. And I knew better. I went through the Dare program. Mm -hmm. I heard Nancy Reagan just mm -hmm. say no. Yeah. You know, but once I realized, you know, that I didn't have an appetite and I lost 20 pounds, you know, and I just kept doing it and had no clue about addiction and alcoholism and all these kinds of things. But looking back, you know, what was driving me to, to deadly, you know, deadly measures to pursue that body type of wanting mm. to look like Kate Moss. Mm. Do you remember bongo jeans? I do. Yeah. Actually. I could never fit in a pair of bongo me jeans. Me neither. Yeah. There's no way. <laughs> I've seen your tree trunks. They're yeah. Impressive. Like I couldn't get them past my calves. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Where were we when we were growing up? You exactly. Know what I mean? Nowhere. Yes. That's, that's the exactly point. exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to uh, mental health around, you know, advertising and media. And then of course, how that's affecting your campaign as yeah. well with, with them blocking you and, mm -hmm. you know, how, um, how that would look say in regards to banning Photoshop or, yeah. um, the apps that, you know, these kids have access to and what that's actually doing to their mental health. And they're our future. Yeah. They're our future. And, you know, like you said, there's, there's the girls that are like, yeah, I want to run for president. Mm -hmm. And there are those that are like, no, why would I want to do that? Yeah. But then we were talking about this yesterday is like, be, do they want to be YouTube stars mm -hmm. or is it because education is too expensive? Right. You know, and you know, you're walking around with like a hundred grand in debt with a master's degree Jeez. and <laughs> <laughs> I have two bachelors and I'm working on a master's oh, and I'm, wow. you know, it's, are you you're continuing the public health? Yeah. Route? Yeah. 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 Um, and so it's like most millennials walk around yeah. with so much debt. And so is that causing people to want to move away from getting degrees to become doctors yeah. and nurses? Because we're always going to be at a shortage for providers. Right. True. You know, but I mean, had I not had the ability to take on those student loans. Yeah. You know, it, it's just education mm -hmm. is hard to access. Yeah. Increasingly so. Yeah. 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 Um, well, let's let's start. I know. With, let's like, start, like, we've got, we, we so got like much. a few things. <laughs> like, I know. I know. Well, I, I want to start start education. with with um, with kids and, yeah. and with young people first, because I mean, to to me, that that is foundational. Excellent. You know, we hear all the time, our kids are our future, right? Yeah. And it's true, but it's unfortunately not backed up with okay, so what? Yep. So what do we do about that? How do we best help set ourselves and them up? to be that future. And um, I just, again, one of the, 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 the most, the, the thing that I have loved most about our campaign is the ability to connect with people from all different parts of the country and listen to them. And so we have teachers coming to our town hall saying that, uh, talking about uh, the skyrocketing rates of suicide and attempted suicide by middle schoolers. Yep. Middle schoolers about kids coming to school, elementary school, who are children of opioid addicts. Yes. And coming with a whole new set of trauma that the teachers are like, we're not trained to help provide for these kids. <laughs> Uh, that's where we started with girl like we, before that it was a program for teenage girls called camp confidence that mm. i started in australia and wanting to teach them what we weren't taught in school yeah. and what was happening is you know they're they're coming in and i'm like what's self-harm mm. and they're cutting themselves yeah. and they have all these issues happening and no teacher or doctor knows how to handle yeah. it and yeah. it, i was mind blown you know around the the rates of this yeah. stuff and one in five girls are you know going to have teenage girls will have depression yeah. i mean just the numbers were mind-blowing yeah so you're and, exactly and that's, right that's where i mean yes there's a resource problem here i mean just teachers alone are paid like shit yeah. compared to what they the responsibility that they have right and the work that they put in and that that they're required to and that they do put in because they really care about their job so that's like baseline standard but then Right. You know, a lot of teachers are like, look, my friends, like they're quitting. They're leaving 
or you have people who are like, I don't know if I want to go be a teacher mm-hmm. um, because you got to take on debt and because yeah. it's tough and you're under resourced, you know, you're not going to barely be able to pay your own bills. Um, so that's, that's baseline. But then you go into, okay, you know, yes, we need smaller classroom sizes. So teachers have the ability to get that quality time with our kids. We need to have far more school counselors than we do yeah. so that teachers aren't doing everything that you have that support there to be able to help deal with kids who are coming in with depression or dealing with these other things that, that are a little bit outside of like math class. You know what I mean? And then there's that, that trauma training that all of these uh, teachers, administrators, faculty need to know in order to help best serve our kids. Um, and to do so, to take this approach in a comprehensive and holistic way that yes, these things cost resources, but if we make this investment in a holistic way and not just like, oh, you're depressed, here's drugs. Oh, mm-hmm. you're, you're anxious, here's drugs. Mm-hmm. But really making that investment on the front end to really care for these little people and and help you know there's there are amazing programs that are that you know are teaching meditation or mm-hmm. getting to the spiritual foundations sold huh there you well, go it's, it's, <laughs> everything, it's everything we're talking about yeah. right so it's you know are you familiar with the adverse childhood experiences Mm-mm. question okay so it was a study that was done out of uh Kaiser San Diego and the CDC back in 1992, and it's put science behind what we know, mm. right? So it's a, it's a questionnaire of 10 questions, and the higher your ACE score, the more there's a dose response, the more likely you're going to suffer from adverse health outcomes, mm. m- mental health issues, depression, anxieties, substance use disorders, um, and then even as far as cardiovascular issues, you know, wow. high blood pressure, yeah. it's all connected through science, right? Um, and so... You know, I, I look at California, and California is on the forefront of this. You know, Nadine Burke, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, our first Surgeon General. Mm-hmm. This was what all of her work was when she was in San Francisco. And so we are looking at not only the ACEs now, but how do you respond to the ACEs and how do you undo? Because what happens is the amount of toxic stress these kids are put under at such an early age Mm -hmm. changes the shape of their brain. When Mm. you're in fight or flight for so long, you know, living in a household with domestic violence, living in a household with with a parent who has a substance use issue, you know, it changes how the brain is formed. And then these kids are growing up without positive adult influences or not having the ability to go out and do these activities stuck behind tablets, you know, not having the food security. And it's like, how do we undo all of that toxic stress? If you're just thinking like about hunger and not starving all day, exactly. how are you going to pay attention? in well, class. Well, and on top of that, adding in those those kids who are who are born drug exposed. Yeah. That's a whole nother layer, yeah. right? And a lot of times, you know, we'll see um, you know, babies who are opioid exposed mm-hmm. who will withdraw within their first few days of life, yeah. right? But then you don't really see anything in in the first few years of life, but they get into the school age they are way behind. Mm. They can't get caught up in their reading levels. They're, you know, and it's it's all that early intervention work, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is getting funding pulled left, right, and center. Right. But it, yeah. And this, I mean, it's that that's where I think it's it's funding, but it's what are we doing with that? It's all going to our war budgets currently. It's it is. It absolutely is. You know, it's it's four billion dollars a month going to Afghanistan. Speak louder, please. <laughs> <laughs> I say again. Say it ten times faster. I dare you. <laughs> four billion a month going to <laughs> Afghanistan. And yet, uh, you know, not enough money for teachers, not enough money for education for our kids, not enough money for clean water in this country. That you have kids in everywhere from Flint to yep. Newark to yep, that was on the list. <laughs> South Carolina Flint. is, I mean, Four billion not a enough month? money to to make sure we have clean water to drink and that we're not poisoning our kids in this country. Um, but yeah. Let's go start another war somewhere that absolutely does not make us any safer and doesn't help the people in the countries where these wars are waged supposedly so often under the guise of humanitarianism. That's what killed me. This is why leadership matters, though. Yes, and you've been there. You can't just talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. And when you said that, I resonated with that so much 
because, you know, as a recovered drug addict and alcoholic of 10 years, you know, it's like somebody that has read about it in a book, but hasn't actually walked down that path, Mm -hmm. isn't going to truly understand. And those that need that solid mentor aren't truly going to resonate with them. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I look at, you know, everybody that's out there it's like have they done what you've done Mm -hmm. you get it you've been there you've done that personal it's real it's not talking points on a page that somebody else wrote correct and that's the same thing i i um you know uh, have people close to me in my life who've struggled with addiction Mm -hmm. in uh pretty devastating ways and the more that i've learned about you and your journey and your path and how still now um, your ability to help connect directly with others who are going through what you went through before, mm-hmm. uh, because you're like, I've been there yep. and I'm still fighting. Yep. I'm still working. And there's a light. Yes. You know, there is hope. Uh, there is a path. And that, that is, um, it is, it's, inc- it's such a powerful, powerful thing just for people to know, like, I'm not alone. Yes, yes. And I can do this. 100%. We find that isolation is at the root of all of this all of this trouble. Yeah. You know, people feeling different then and they don't mm-hmm. belong to community mm-hmm. and that's why I keep hearing you say is, you know, community grassroots. Yeah. And that's where, you know, the magic happens. And this togetherness. Yeah. And um it is. That that's that is it's it's like integral to our identity and who we are. Uh, as people, you know, we're all God's children. We're all connected. And the more that we are rooted in that true understanding of our identity, then we can begin to gain that peace of mind to know that we're never alone. Yep. And that consciousness that whether you're in business or in public health or in politics or the military or in education, whatever whatever you know your toolkit consists of that and this is just what i experienced in my life i didn't i never thought about politics growing up but i knew that i was i was just happiest when i was doing good things for other people right it's not rocket science is no, it no you and build anybody can do it yeah, yeah. and doing a steam of black exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly and i still count on my fingers and, and i can tell you that <laughs> and also i'm still stuck on four billion a month yeah. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. So yeah. forgive me. I'm, I'm back here That's about two right, minutes. So I'm like. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Just, just to break yeah. it down. That's five and a half million dollars an hour. So you're a small business owner and, you know, <laughs> thinking about, thinking about. That makes me want to smash that, a, yeah. a watermelon. <laughs> Wait, when summer I, comes, I hope, I'm going to teach you. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've got some tricks up my sleeve. I am sure you do. We're going to get CNN's attention somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I got a plan. I don't doubt somewhere. it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's up that bicep. That's what's up. <laughs> Words I have never heard strung together in a sentence like that before. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it, though. That's- so you... Um, <laughs> I, I would just love to hear. I, I my parents are teachers by trade and training, small business owners, entrepreneurs at heart, and so growing up as kids, we were just instilled with that um, mindset. That's awesome. Nothing is for free. Nothing yep. is is just handed to you. Everything is is earned, and it started with like five kids in our house. You know, pretty pretty rowdy, and parents were like, even when you're 10, 12, 14 years old, like okay, you broke that window because you were screwing around in the house. That's fine. I'll let you know what the bill is. Right. You can go deliver newspapers. Go get a paper you, job. You'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll pay me back no, to fix the it. Same age. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. And so they started a family restaurant. You know, my brothers were there. They were washing dishes, cashier. Yep. My sister and I were wiping tables, sweeping the floor. And, <sighs> and so I just, I have uh, just a great admiration for you and what you... Um, have created and are still building and growing. And, Thank and you. I would just, you know, for so many women, especially who, um, everybody looking for that freedom of yep. not being shackled to a job that you hate, but you need because it has health insurance right, or right. because like you got to pay the bills, but um, being able to, you know, kind of step out of that comfort zone and, yeah take a plunge yeah and and you from the little i know (laughs) like you've 
You've done that and you're still doing it. Yeah, it's a little bit of a plunge. <laughs> so you you yeah. started Girl how many years ago? Four and a half. Okay. We've been working on it for five. Yeah. Yeah, but we just, we had our fourth birthday in November okay. of last year. Yeah, it's been a, a wild ride. Yeah. And I absolutely resonate with, you know, what you're saying uh, with, you know, being brought up in that middle class mm -hmm. and, you know, you want something, you got to work for it. Yeah. And, you know, how that's, you know, what that looks like today and, you know, other generations and like this, you know, attitude of instant gratification. Yeah. Entitlement. And, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, we what? need to pull our- You won't give me a job? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, we need to pull up our boots. Yeah. Get back to the roots of working hard. And, yeah. You know, yeah. fight for what you want. Yeah. And it's not just going to fall in your lap. Mm -hmm. And you got to just keep showing up. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's been- a lot easier because I have a strong why, mm. you know, and what is that? And it's to bring women together and to, to empower women to be more than what they they think their body is and that mm. their worth is not connected to their exterior, Yeah, you know? And so there's that, that one piece. Cause I think, gosh, the amount of years. So even after, you know, getting through addiction and, you know, these various things and sexual assault, you know, I was raped at 17 and, Gosh. you know, it, it's, um, it, the, the amount of that happening and that. And can I just say you know, kudos to you for talking about it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, yeah. it is, um, I, yeah. I've, I've done a lot of work in Congress around um, saw that. sexual assault in the military yep, we, yeah. and the barriers to justice and fairness uh, for them. And, um, you know, it's these, these institutions from that, from that perspective that are supposed to be about protecting the innocent. What was that documentary? The Invisible War. Exactly. I'm mind blown. Exactly. Mind blown. But so much of it, whether it's, and, and you know, I mean, these are women, women are, are, are uh, often most spoken about as victims of sexual assault in the military, but the numbers of men mm -hmm. who are victims yeah. go far more unreported yep. even than yep. women. But across the board, they're not feeling like they can report these crimes because they feel they have no faith in the justice system itself, but also just for so many reasons. There's so much stigma that yep. is attached to someone who says this happened yep. and there needs to be justice and, and um, yeah. to know that you're not going to be shamed and disparaged as like, oh, okay, you're, you're, you're that girl yeah, that's or you're right. that guy. So I just want to say thank you for, you know, going through the hardship yourself of talking about thank you you know what you've lived through there's a lot of power in it you know and you start to realize too once you share your story there's there's so much in that that you know you grow from it and of course after the first it was really the first 10 years I couldn't talk about it without crying yeah you know and then you get to a point where it gives you power mm. and um, authenticity is very freeing and you know that's how you come across as well it's like yeah. once you're you put it out there, nobody can take it away from you, right. you know? And I know sometimes being a too much of an open book can, you know, come back on occasion. But again, it's if you, you know, you can acknowledge where you've yeah. been, what you've done, you've, you know, cleaned up the wreckage or, yeah. you know, you've faced everything, then nobody can take anything away from no. you. Cause it's like, yeah, cause I said it first. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly it right. First. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, you know, and that, that's, that's the why is like, and you've said so many, everything you say, I resonate with, I swear, but you know, letting women know that, yeah, you're not alone, mm -hmm. you know, and that we are in this together. And, you know, you might be Hindu, I might be atheist mm -hmm. or Buddhist or mm -hmm. Christian mm -hmm. or, you know, a Muslim. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we have different religions and we have different backgrounds and beliefs. We don't have to like each other, but we have to love each other. Yes. Full stop. Yes. And, you know, listen to understand and to not be right. And like you said, everything that you're saying, it's like, this is what we need. Yeah. And that I believe is that female energy that we're missing. Yeah. You know, I, I love men. I'm married to one. And sometimes I think I'm part man. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, you want to yeah. measure biceps, son? I got you. Let's go arm wrestle. Ah, you can't smash a watermelon because your balls will get hurt. Uh, 
calm down, Courtney. <laughs> uh, but you know, and you, the other thing too, is this is like, it's, it's not about having a woman president. It's about having the right woman yeah. or the right president, the right president. And exactly. it's not, you know, we're, we're taking the focus away from, you know, uh, well, what that means to being a woman versus a man, or it's like being a person. Exactly. Right. That's where we've got to get to. Yeah. To get past the broad categorizations. Yeah. Like all the things you just said, whether it's religion or gender, orientation, uh, you know, race, ethnicity, all these. Well, if you are attached to this label, therefore you are X, Y, or Z. Right. When it's all bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it's just not, you know, I mean, there's there's yeah, so many different examples that that we could point to that that disprove all of these uh, boxes and labels and you know the identity politics that are used to try to um, you know it's really weaponizing yes. individuals for whether it's political gain, money, power, influence, whatever that is. Um, I mean, yeah, to me, it's, it's undermining that sense of togetherness that we should have as a country and that, um, you know, just, just humanity overall. How many times have people asked you about your hair? Um, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I didn't really realize it would be such a thing. It's awesome. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I just wonder what I it's like. I wasn't, uh, yeah, I, I, First, I first kind of started to, to gray in that area after my deployments. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was, it was just something I decided to keep. That's all you should just do is be like, it's in the hair. Yeah. You don't have to ask me about That's anything. Right. It's in the hair. That's right. You haven't been deployed, <laughs> so shut up. Yeah. Yeah. So where were we? We've got a lot of things that we went through and read and resonated with and you know, I think um, one of the other big things too was the criminal justice reform. Yeah. Um, and you know, looking at uh, one other question we had too was, what what beyond marijuana, like when we say the war on drugs, yeah. what what does that look like aside? You know, because I from personal experience, I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah. We'll name we'll call them Kevin just for. Uh, you know, anonymity purposes, mm -hmm. but we'll say I've got two brothers. One's Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, and one's Kevin, K-E-V-E-N. Okay. And one step, one's half. And uh, one used to work a, a government job, you know, six days a week, 12 hours a day, wasn't seeing his kids, and got into the marijuana industry as a lifestyle so he could spend more time with his family, mm. not to drive flashy cars and all yeah. the rest of it. And then the other brother, Kevin, is a head of the drug task force mm. for the county and the sheriff's department. So one brother one day accidentally started an investigation on the other brother. Mm. So one Kevin busted the other Kevin, and now you know six years later the other Kevin, even though it's legal and you can go out and buy weed legally for recreational purposes on the corner here in Las Vegas or you know in, in quite a few states, uh, but the one Kevin is in federal prison. And this yeah. man growing up was my icon, my role model, mm. you know, and I should have, if anybody, it should have been me. I used to drive around in a blackout on a daily basis. Mm. I'd steal your wallet, Tulsi, and help you look for it. Mm. I was a bad girl. No, I mean, as I say, I mean, not at the heart because addicts yeah. are not bad people yeah. who need to get good. Yeah. We are sick people that need to get well. Exactly. hundred percent. But he, you know, just a, a, good man, full of morals, yeah. values. You know, if you didn't get your change out of the cash register that, you know, you left it somewhere, he would grab it and run after you, yeah. you know? And so I just think in, in hearing of his experiences of being shackled from, you know, foot to, to wrist and being transported around and him saying, you know, everybody that are in these, whilst, you know, in the, the process of going from, you know, cause it's quite an ordeal to, you know, this the sentencing and then going from uh, a county jail or, you know, to then through the federal system, yep. you know, I'm just because like- Because it is a federal prohibition. Yeah. That, and regardless of what your local or state laws may be, ultimately, even now, as majority of states have already legalized in some mm -hmm. form or another cannabis, it is a federal prohibition and yeah. you can be charged yep. with a federal crime. Yeah. 
and the, you know the privatization of, of prisons and you know starting to get like an inside track on all this stuff that I just had no clue about or then watching the 13th mm-hmm. you know that documentary on on Netflix you yep. know the 13th amendment and all these things I'm just like this is mind-blowing to then actually see how much time and energy and money and you know all, all wasted on on what yeah yeah so that yeah. was something that really stood out to us and you know, and then wondering beyond marijuana, what's the next step with the war on drugs? Yeah. Like what, what would that look like? Yeah. I think, I think it's important to start with marijuana yeah. because we're already seeing, um, we're already seeing so much movement and interest that crosses party lines Yeah, and saying like, whether there's so many different directions you can go with this, where, whether it's from a purely medicinal perspective directly linking it, for example, to the opioid epidemic, that states that have legalized marijuana at one level or another are seeing a direct correlation and a reduction in opioid addiction and right. opioid-related deaths, number one. Number two, veterans who are coming back, post-traumatic stress, mm-hmm. chronic pain, TBI, all of these things. And I know people personally, they're like, they know, I have a friend of mine who's a medic came back, he's like, I don't want Oxycontin. I don't want any of these highly addictive drugs, but because it's a federal prohibition, the VA is not even allowed to say, hey, go to your local dispensary and they'll hook you up. They're not allowed to by law to say that. We tried to uh, get a hearing for the VA to come in to Congress and say, you know, how many veterans are coming in and asking for this? Actually, give us information. Can you provide a report on what impact it would have on veterans if um, if this federal prohibition were lifted? They wouldn't even do that. So that's one level. And then the other one that really is uh, oh, there's two. There's two. There you mentioned it. There's there's the fiscal and social cost mm-hmm. on individuals, their kids, their families, people who have been charged with. Uh, you know, minor nonviolent marijuana uh, charges, seeing their 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 not only their lives, but the lives of their families and those around them completely upended and and torn apart. And then there is the um, there's just the basic principle of freedom, right? Freedom of choice. Yeah, I may not agree with. Like for me, I've never smoked pot and I won't. Yeah. That's just my choice. I'd eat you out of your house and home. So <laughs> Which is cool. <laughs> I, I'm a good cook. I can hook you up. <laughs> that's awesome. I tend to I'm like, yeah, no, I can't. I can't. <laughs> but that's that's the whole point is is whether whether my choice is the same as your choice doesn't matter. The yeah. point is that this is my body. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make my choices for myself. And you're going to make your choices for yourself. And at even from like a very, and this is where there's like a little bit of contradiction with some of my conservative friends who are about less government and freedom and civil liberties and, and all of these things. But then it's like, okay, so let's get rid of this federal prohibition on marijuana because it just doesn't make sense at all. Like if you want to regulate at the local level, fine, do that. Make sure that you're not marketing it to kids, you know, good, let's do that. But then they're like, oh, but. I don't want my kids smoking pot. It's like, okay, like that's on you, mom or dad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like go, go and talk to your kids about that. Like people like Kevin shouldn't be thrown in freaking prison yeah. because you don't want your kids to smoke pot. Like right. there's, there's, they just think clearly about this. And that, that then takes us to the overall war on drugs. Like we've got to recognize how completely it's failed, how the institutional racism in this country has, uh, caused such a disproportionate number of people to be imprisoned and incarcerated because this war on drugs, largely impacting people of color and people coming from really poor communities and how it's not helped. Like it's been going on for decades and yet we're not seeing like fewer drugs on the streets. We're not seeing less gang related crime. Um, You know, we're not seeing fewer people in our prisons. If anything, it's only gotten worse. So, you know, I think the details of how we shift have to be worked out, but I believe that if we look at how countries like Portugal have tackled this, mm-hmm. yep. this is how we can find kind of the markers and the, the lessons learned that we say, okay, we're not Portugal, obviously, we're a big country, but we can figure out how to move away from an issue of criminalizing substance use or abuse and addiction 
uh, to one where we're actually helping people who need to be well yeah. in all the ways that, that that requires and entails. And like, and, and I'm, I'm astounded that in the world of politics, even at this point, uh, maybe I should, I'm not astounded actually when you think about it, but how few people even know about what Portugal did and is doing and how the knee-jerk reaction from politicians when you talk about drugs is just like drugs, bad, crime, jail. Like that's kind of just like boom, 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 right? Rather than like, oh my gosh, like people, people actually in this place for whatever reason, they, they need help. Yes. They need help, whether you're someone who is uh, struggling with addiction or you're the kid growing up in the Bronx and seeing from those around you that you don't have any opportunity to put food on the table or have like a roof over your head or even survive unless you, um, you know, pick a gang that you want to and start pushing drugs on the street. Right. And so the, the spectrum is so great about the impact of this and how we could solve so many of these problems by just seeing it for what it is and not the, pol the, the, political, the politically safe right. view. Yeah. And this, this, I think this applies across the board to every single challenge and issue that we're facing in the country that people are struggling with. Like a lot of the ones we've talked about here, the many more that we won't have time to talk about is I we've know, gotta huh? get to the root cause. Yep. Mm -hmm. If we don't get to the root cause, then we're just gonna continue kind of papering things over, wrapping them up in, oh, fancy wrapping. Oh, we passed a bill that's gonna fix this. Like legislation alone is not gonna solve it. Yep. Like there is some legislation that's required like this. Let's, let's start with ending the federal marijuana prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not, that's not all. Let's start you know, ending private prisons, make it so people are profiting off of right. keeping those, those prison cells full. There, there are definitely sentencing reform, prison reform, you know, ending this, this, uh, this school to prison pipeline that's starting like with kids in elementary yeah. school, walking out of the classroom in handcuffs. Like, let's, like why? Let's ask that question, why? <sighs> You know, and not just not just say, well, this is zero Try tolerance. Trying to put a band aid on it, right? Yeah, understand that. You know, kind of how we start this conversation. We're all unique people. We're all bringing different experiences, and kids are bringing trauma that that uh, that they did not create. Um, and getting to a place where we can care, yeah, really care for each other, kind and of loop that all back in. I know, huh? right? Yeah, it. But it does, right? It it, it comes full circle. It just comes down to like that basic. Aloha and yeah, respect yeah. and care for each other. And no matter how different we may be, seeing each other in each other's eyes. I'm just sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking of these massive issues and I'm like, how would you even start to scratch the surface yeah. in four years? You yeah. know, but you're you keep coming back to this fundamental thing of respect. Yeah. And it's like, you know, until we establish that and stop people being, you know, uh, I'm on team A or team mm -hmm. B. You know, we're, we're not going to get anywhere. No. And you keep coming back to that. And that is what is just remarkable and, and what we need. And I believe what we're missing. Truly. You know, and Truly. that's um, that gets me fired up. And then, of course, thinking about big pharma, I'm like, well, I know a girl army. So, I mean, we'll, you know, yeah, we'll put a big old barricade around you. Like, Come at us. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like, I'm like, <laughs> who's going to take this down? Yeah. You know, who, who's going to be the one? So yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, it, it, it comes down to, and this is, this has been the beautiful thing that I've experienced that even as on the debate stages, even it's progressives versus conservatives, it's the left versus the right Democrats versus Republicans, but at every single one of our town halls, every one of our campaign rallies without exception, we have Democrats, Republicans, independents, libertarians there together. And as I'm talking about the same things we're talking about here, they're all nodding their heads or they're all clapping and they're like looking around. And I, I started asking people, I was like, raise your hand if you're a Democrat, raise your hand if you're a Republican, raise your hand if you're independent or libertarian. And people are looking around the room like, oh my gosh, like this is awesome that we're here and able to like, yeah, no, we're not gonna agree on everything. Right. But foundationally, foundationally, we're able to come and share a space where we see each other as fellow Americans, we treat each other with respect and know that even as our ideas may be different on how we solve these problems, 
we're coming from that same uh, starting point, that same foundation with the same objective. Right. And that's the key. And, and realizing that, you know, even if I'm walking in the door saying, hey, I got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what we need to do. Lay it on the table. And then you were coming like, hmm, there's a big gaping hole right there. Maybe you didn't see. What about this? Like, oh, my God, that's right. awesome. Right. You're right. You know what I mean? And seeing the, the strength and the power in that. And that's how we, that's how we bring about this bigger change. Because you don't have that ego attached to you. Right. You know, you didn't right. build the Taj Mahal and then be like, yeah. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> whoops. Can I have a do-over? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So. But that's how we get to it. Like whether it's big pharma, big insurance, you know, like the big agribusiness corporations who don't care about nutrition. I wrote that down too. <laughs> I was like, I had so many yep. questions for you. Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, this, this is, this is going to continue. Yeah. It has to. So what's next? Like, what can we do to fight back against the media machine? And obviously social media is, yeah. is beneficial. Um, but what's, yeah. you're still in it. Yeah. You're still in it to win it. That's mm -hmm. remarkable. Yeah. The fact that you've been able to do that without having all these massive pots to dip into. Yeah. Bloomberg. To say the um, least. Yeah, you know. I, I barely got one pot, sister. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> We're squatting And it in the ain't woods. massive, trust yeah. me. <laughs> We're squatting in the woods. We're, like We're not even pissing Five bucks, guys. Can you get five bucks? That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I get the emails. It's like yep. 12 bucks. Yep. I'm like, yeah, yep. I like that number. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. And you keep, that's, you keep making it. That's, you keep making it. That's that's how and that's that's my why though. That's my yeah. why when people are like, why are you still in this? Like, you know, I didn't I didn't decide to run for president because I I want to be the president. It it has always and continues to be about bringing about this foundational change in our foreign policy, in our governance so that it's actually focused on service, service to the people, instead of, well, my party's got to win and your party's got to lo lose, my tribe's got to win, and therefore your tribe must lose. No, it's about getting, getting deeper in um, yeah, seeing, seeing past all of these things and uh, just staying focused on that mission of, of who I'm fighting for, who we're fighting for, right. and what's at stake. You know, this isn't about a quote unquote political career because I've never, I've, that's never crossed my mind. I've been in and out of, I've served in the state house, city council, and now in Congress, but never once in my life have I thought, well, I'm going to pursue a career in politics because that's not what it's about. It's about service. And right. I'm constantly assessing and reassessing. So you're saying, what's next? I'm constantly assessing how can I best be of service? And whether it's through the realm of politics or through another path, I don't really care. I don't care what, what, um, it's just how, how can I make that best positive impact? You know, and that is, I think the thing that just keeps sticking out to is service. Yeah. You know, I remember at one point I've accidentally fell into network marketing at some stage in my mm -hmm. life. Yeah. It's kind oh. of a rite of passage though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> my mom, my mom is, I've like, our whole family has kind of walked down that road right? with her. Right, it's that entrepreneur oh, yeah. background. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, same with my folks Be your as own well. boss, you know. Yeah, 100%. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, that's funny. But looking back and, you know, being in some of these conventions and trainings yeah. you know, they'd always come back to the the four primary motives you know you've got your yellows for people that like to have fun mm. your reds the drivers those that have to win and uh, the the whites the philanthropic kind of people and then the blues who are people that are driven by service mm. and that was all day long all day long is is being of service because you know, that gets you out of our selves and being yes. self-centered and our ego and poor me, Yes. you know, and like you said, fills your cup up. Yeah. Right. And so you In keep the deepest saying possible that. way. Yeah. And that is what we're missing. And what we have right now is this big, ugly, nasty, glaring, reddish, orange color mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like, ah, I gotta win, gotta win. Yeah. And it's, it's not working. Yeah. Gotta and win at the expense of, of others. Of who and what. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right that kind of zero sum mentality yeah that's that's so prevalent in our day-to-day -day politics in our foreign policy and when you when you really understand like okay in order for 
either at an individual level or group level or a national level in order for us to win, that does not require other people right. to have to, to lose. lose. Exactly. And that really when you're looking for real solutions, again, whether it's related to national security, the coronavirus, economic opportunity, uh, cybersecurity, counterterrorism, you really see that if we're able to build partnerships um, with other leaders, with other countries, with other people that are based around like these are these are central concerns to all of us in this mm. very little world that we live in together. And that the more we can take this win-win approach, um, the closer we are to achieving that opportunity and peace and prosperity for all people yeah. and protection of our planet. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is, it's a complete change of that mindset and that goes away from kind of the dog eat dog yeah, right. environment, survival yeah. of the fittest and all of that to, um, you know, seeing that there's, there's incredible, uh, strength. It's gotta be a win-win. Yeah. It's like, you're the definition of assertiveness. You know, I am? finding, I feel, hmm. yeah, because you're constantly like, we've got to make this work for everybody. Yeah. And creating a win win. Yeah. And not, you know, it, it's, it's got to, it's got to make sense for everybody. Yeah. And um, I, I keep hearing that over and over again. Yeah. Um, my, one of my last few questions is um, pertaining to girls in sports, because mm -hmm. I, I, I've been looking at you and I'm like, you know, you've got that air of confidence and assertiveness and mm. you know um all those things that i i believe young girls need to see in a role model and i'm, I'm curious to to find out how much of that do you think has come from sports mm. and you being physically active uh growing up because you yeah. surf you snowboard you do martial arts yeah um that's a good question i've never thought of it from that perspective all right <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I think, I think that, um, that definitely, I'm just thinking back to my childhood now. I've always been like very, this will shock you, I know, but I've always been very nonconformist, <laughs> like in the most stupid and small ways. Like when all the kids were getting like this thing, they're like, Psh. I don't want that thing, even if maybe I did, but yeah, like, yeah. no, I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to follow you guys. Are you kidding me? You're a like, trendsetter. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, I think the, the being, being able, I, I've learned and like been like a lifelong yoga practitioner, even from a kid time, even when I didn't really like understand the depths of, of the kind of life changing impact of yoga but uh, having that foundation in yoga and in martial arts and that connection with um, nature and getting out in the ocean and all the lessons that, you know, right. Mother Nature has to teach us about how powerless we actually are. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, uh, 100%. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think all of that and, and just for, for um, definitely contributed to... Uh, feeling comfortable with myself and who knowing who I am. And I think the, the most important thing just for me personally in my life is, has been and continues to be my, my own spiritual foundation that, you know, yoga for me goes beyond yoga, like asanas and different poses and stretches. I gotta get into something other than Bikram. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, it's the yoga for me, it's, it's yoga meditation. It's, it's, um, you know, developing bhakti yoga, developing a personal loving relationship with God that has nothing to do with a church or a temple or right. a religion. It's just, it's about love. It's about love for God. And, and for me, the guiding motivation for what I'm doing is what better way to make God happy than to take care of God's children, like to, to work for the well-being of God's children on our planet. And that's universal. Right. And um, that's where, because I, I grew up, even as like confident in sports and in, in martial arts and all of this, I was incredibly shy and introverted talking to not like forget talking to a group of people, just talking mm. to a stranger. Me too. Freaked me out. Me too. Like heavy duty anxiety. <laughs> I just didn't, I just didn't do it. Like I told my sister, I was like, okay, you go ask the lady in the supermarket if they have any more milk in the back yeah. or whatever, you know, <laughs> like I was like, but the way that I got through my own um, challenges in in finding uh, comfort and confidence in speaking to strangers, speaking in front of large groups of people, speaking on camera, all this stuff, 
it came from um, that realization that all of my fears and anxieties were actually super self-centered, like selfish to the max, right? Like, right. what are they going to think about me? What exactly. if I sound stupid? What if they exactly. ask a question I don't know the answer to? And what if, what if? And I just, I realized that, and this was after I had already run for office and been elected, and like it was so hard for me to go and to a room full of people and know like, oh my God, I got to go and talk to people. I got to go shake their hand. I got to go and like, maybe they're going to ask me to say something and what am I going to do? And this was after all that, finally, it, it really, um, it hit me like, why the fuck do you care about yourself so much when your whole life is about others? It's about service to others and how you can do for them and how you can help them. And that just like, you're good. That changed everything. You're good. So walking into that room, it's <laughs> yeah. like, this it's isn't about me. me. Like I have the mm -hmm. opportunity to come in and whether I shake your hand or give you a hug or just say, aloha, how are you? This is about my opportunity to be able to care for you. Like, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know your story, your background. But if even for that split second, I can share that aloha, share that love with you, then maybe that'll mean something. Maybe it'll do something. That's what we're missing. Yes. Mother nature, caring, nurturing, yes. supporting, empathetic, yeah. listening. Yeah. Mic drop, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and you said that too, you know, being it's not the the Chinese army, it's it's nothing military, it's not, you know, nuclear weapons, yeah. it's mother nature. Yeah. She'll wipe our ass out in a heartbeat, right? Yeah. Seriously. And you Seriously. you get that. Yeah. And seeing the strength and love. Mm -hmm. And I think that that goes back to some of the things we talked about, you know, and pe how people may perceive what, what will the first woman president be like and um, what I've seen just through the course of service in the military and how people perceive you as a female soldier walking into the room based on all of these other perceptions, misperceptions of um, what we as women are capable of and that we are not all the same. Yeah. And um, understanding at a foundation level, as Dr. Martin Luther King did, that, you know, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. That love right. is truly the most powerful force in the world. And whether you're a soldier or you're a firefighter running into a burning building or, you know, you're a mom, like, and your kid is running in the middle of the street and a car is coming immediately you are willing to sacrifice yourself for those that you love. Yeah. Whether they are people who are of your own blood or total strangers, that that love is what um, it is. It is the most powerful force mm. to bring change, to heal our pain, and to bring us together. Yeah, I don't know if these tears and my eyes welling up are like, you know, from my former conspiracy self and hearing you say, oh, love is the answer. And I'm thinking, I'm like, mm, thinking of all these YouTube <laughs> videos I watch. I'm like, don't record that. We got a protector. <laughs> but then also being like, gosh, that's what we're missing. Yeah. As what we are missing 100%. Yeah. You know, uh, so I just, what do we need to do? <laughs> like, what, whatever it takes, you know, and yeah. then the, the frustration of, of the media. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's important for every single one of us, no matter who you are or where you are, to understand the power of your voice. Yeah. And even if you think you're alone, you're not. Even if you think your voice doesn't matter, it does. Even if you think you have no ability to influence others, you do. Yeah. Every one of us does, especially, especially in the world of social media now. Yeah. It just, you know, when you think in the traditional sense of people who you know at work, people who you know at school, people in your family, like that already is a huge sphere of influence where we can all turn the things we're talking about into action, where you've got that crazy uncle who can't stop talking about Trump. And you're like, man, I don't even want to talk to him anymore. Go talk to him. <laughs> Go talk to him. He's like, yo, like, just, just tell me, tell me what's up and start peeling back the layers and start increasing that understanding, you know? And then, and then the same thing you hear on that, social Dad? media. <laughs> I love you, man. You're still, my, you go. you're still my hero and best friend, but there's no swamp. They're all in the swamp, except for this one from across from me, okay? She's uh, keeping it real. Yeah, the, the swamp is much deeper than, right? than uh, people are making it out to be. Mm -hmm. but, but that, just it's, it's 
every one of us, like you don't have to run for president right. to be a leader. You don't have to uh, be this like badass, uh, you know, leader, business owner, influencer online to have an impact on other people. There is so much power that we have in our own voices when we stop thinking about ourselves yes. and start thinking about others and yeah. you know how we respond and how we reach out and whether it's on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever it is, or it's within those who like, as I tell people like, go open your phone and start scrolling through all the contacts you got in your phone. Have you called every single person on that phone and says, hey, do you know what Tulsi Gabbard's about? If the answer is no, there you go. If you want to know what to do, go do that. That's a good say, answer. Hey, go follow her on social media. Like we're putting out a lot of content. Go and see what's actually going on. And then you can make a better informed decision about what kind of leadership you want in this country. Yeah. Yes, for this election, but this is so much bigger than just this election. Yeah. This is so much bigger. I am not hanging my hat up and paddling out forever to surf I want to rip my <laughs> and shirt leaving off the world behind. <laughs> Wave it around That my is head. not happening. Like this, this is um, the reason why I decided to run for president. And, it, and it, in some ways it was, it was a clear decision. In other ways, it, it was not an easy decision just knowing what it entails. I can't imagine. Those things don't go away mm -hmm. after the Democratic Convention after the general election. And so it's important for us if we really care about, um, if we care about our future, yep. if we care about the greed and the corruption that isn't some far off thing, but that is impacting every single one of us in every way then um, we have to be actively part of the solution. Right. That's not just about passing bills. It's deep systemic change. It's a spiritual foundational change that, um, that, that we need. And we are the only ones who can make it happen. 100%. Damn. That's some, that's some brilliant stuff right there. And, you know, we're going to loop back around and we'll, we'll look at, uh, you know, all the funding we're going to provide for youth sports and yeah. banning apps that make everybody look like clouds with a 20 inch waist mm, and yes, all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, but what you have out there now currently in, in on your site, I think is, is great stuff. And there's so many points too, that we didn't yeah, even I know. touch on, you know, <laughs> second amendment and yeah. All those things, like I, I, and I'm not pissing in your pocket. No. You know, I definitely don't like rocking the boat, but mm -hmm. I would, I would say, hey, this is, you know, this is a crock of shit. Mm -hmm. what, what's up with this? Mm -hmm. But everything we went through, you know, made, made sound sense. And, and I think it should. Yeah. Really. I mean, <laughs> if it didn't, it'd be, it'd be a problem. <laughs> it'd be a problem. But that's, the, that's not, you know, as they say, common sense is not so common. Yes, right? yes. And this is the problem. Yeah. Is it's, just, it's just so much about tribalism, and it's like yeah. you're either for guns or you hate guns. Yeah. You're either, like, care, you either care about kids being shot up in schools or you don't. Right. right. And neither of those things are true. Right. There's, and, and the same... Anyway, I know. I, it's just like, I almost said, like, let's yeah, talk about Bowling for Columbine. Let's talk about. <laughs> right. I was like, just we could be yeah. here literally all day. Yeah. But I think we, I mean, I think the most important things we did talk about because yeah. the, those are the core things that apply to every one of these issues. I do not like that man. I need to know him better. <sighs> That's the mic drop. Can moment. we put that on a shirt? <laughs> I think we need to. I think so too. I think we need to. And, it's just and keep it humble. Like you're yeah. also, you know, that's just when we started with Holly home when mm -hmm. she beat Rhonda and uh, that she Rhonda didn't want to touch gloves. Mm. Holly was, you know, very humble and and humbled her. And you know, Rose and you saw and, you saw something special in Holly before the rest of us even yeah. knew her name. And 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 what Lee happened? And, you you I mean. You invested in in her. Uh, what did yeah. you say? You invested every. You cashed in your four hundred one k. My weak ass four hundred one k, and you know, some money from grandma yeah. and 
And we, you took that leap of faith. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. You got to have faith. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think, then she, and then she whooped her ass. The world. <laughs> yeah. She, she like seriously broke her jaw. That was, yeah, that was that fight. Right. Yeah. 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 The night night. Those yeah. lights out. Yeah. And so. then what was it the next day or the next, next day week? we launched? Yeah. Yeah. And we, we sold in one day what we projected to do in six months. Yeah. And that's when I knew it was some higher power thing. It was a universal yeah. guidance of something, yeah. you know, cause the odds of that were just, you know, so upside down. Right. And, you know, so when you're saying the word God and all these kinds of things, I think that's the other thing too, with, you know, the, the division in this country is religion and that mm-hmm. being such a loaded word. Yeah. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, can we all agree that there is a God and we are not it, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's, we're all connected or, mm-hmm. you know, it's the super a team. Yeah, I don't know. Buddha and G, they're all up there together. Who knows? We don't yeah. know. Yeah. There's so however, much. that that is the thing. However, however you choose to worship, or if you choose mm-hmm. not to, um, we can all there's, still get along. We we have to. Yeah. Like we have to. We have to see the. We have to recognize the connectedness that we have. I don't want to live in Mad Max. You no. Know. No. No. Uh-uh. I like taking it's a, a shower. It's a good movie, but I do collect yeah. I do collect shampoos when I travel in little time. <laughs> You're one of those. <laughs> I told you. Oh, I'm sitting here it. there's so many things going through my head. I'm like, ah, I wish I was at Joe Rogan's yeah. level right now, yeah. you know. No, so. no, no. This is this is um <laughs> but yeah. No, <laughs> we're, we're have this, this Joe Rogan has got his own thing. We got our, yeah, own we thing. got our own thing. Yeah. We got our own thing, yeah. but I stopped collecting shampoo bottles. Cause I'm like, whatever, I'll just shave it off again. It's fine. We are not our hair. We are no. not our gray stripe. We no. are not our, you know, implants or no. non implants or no, we're none of that. We are not our, our body. We no, are we're not, here. they're like clothes. You take them on. You that's know? right. Change them, whatever. It's, that's, it's, it. uh, that's, that's exactly Knock right. Knock someone's head off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> capable, worthy, strong, yeah. powerful, caring, nurturing, fixing things, mm-hmm. not just talking about it, been yeah. there, done that. Mm-hmm. Do you feel good after all that? I do, I do too. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel yeah. like you're on the team, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I was on the team because I'm like, I'm, I am, you know, channeling you. I'm, I'm living this. I'm all about it. And, but, you know, now it's just, it's a whole nother level. I was fangirling a bit. That's probably why I didn't sleep. No, to be frank. no, I mean, between the way Lee, yeah, the way Lee's fight and, you know, yeah. and then fangirling a bit. Yeah. No, so. I, I'm grateful. I've been looking forward to actually meeting you in person. <laughs> Good. And, um, when are we getting this Vegas town hall happening? When are you coming back here? What's, what's next? Where we'll, can we like we'll figure it out with you? We're, we're kind of working on the schedule. We're, um, assessing now, you know, seeing, seeing the moving landscape on, on how and where we can kind of bring the heaviest punch. Cool. And um, we'll let you know. Keep us posted. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to get you uh, up to speed on on smashing these watermelons because I uh, don't think anybody you're running against could could do that. <laughs> I don't think they could do a lot of things that you do. So I, I agree with your assessment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking the thank time. You. And I'm thank gonna you both. This go is get my so phone special. Out. I know a lot of people. So yeah, absolutely. Making those texts. There you go. Cool. Thank you. Till next time. Aloha. Aloha.